do you think that when your own party reacted so strongly against what she said? I know this would be somewhat shocking for some, but I think Islamophobia is very much among the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. Rashida Tlaib doubling down on her support for fellow Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, blaming the rebuke of her anti-Semitic remarks on Islamophobia. Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz is the author of The Case Against Impeaching Donald Trump. He joins us right now from Miami. Uh, professor, what do you make of her comments uh, regarding your party? Your party has the same problem the Republicans have. Well, they come up with a new tactic. When you accuse somebody, even truthfully, of making anti-Semitic statements, the very accusation, whether truthful or not, is called Islamophobic. So it provides a complete defense, no matter who made the accusation, whether it's Hillary, well, I'm sorry, whether it's Chelsea Clinton, who called out uh, Omar for her anti-Semitic statements, and she's attacked at NYU for uh, causing, contributing to the tragedy in New Zealand, or President Trump, who's also accused of causing the tragedy in New Zealand. It's a new justification for anti-Semitism. You can't call anybody out for making anti-Semitic statements, because if you do, you're guilty of bigotry. You're Islamophobic. So Chelsea Clinton, who lives in Manhattan, is around NYU, and here is the incident that you're referring to, that not only are you uh, defending her, but Don Jr. was defending her over the weekend. Listen. This, this right here is the result of a massacre stoked by people like you and the words that you have put out into the world. And I want you to know that and I want you to feel that deep inside. The 49 people died because of the rhetoric that you put out there. 49 people died because of the rhetoric that Chelsea Clinton put out there? Are you kidding? Well, it's amazing because Omar claims that the rest of us in the world are trying to stifle dissent that all she wants to do is encourage dissent. She's trying to stifle dissent. But yet, people who in support of her are saying, no, 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 you cannot call out anti-Semitism. That's not appropriate speech. Because if you do identify anti-Semitic statements and condemn them as everybody in the world should, you're guilty of bigotry and Islamophobia. It's designed to prevent people from calling out Farrakhan, from calling out Omer, from calling out anybody else who's made anti-Semitic statements. You cannot do that anymore, because if you do, you and Chelsea Clinton will be blamed for every anti-Muslim fanatic statement or act that's done anywhere in the world. It's designed to stifle debate, and yep. everybody should recognize that. We should have the complete and full freedom to call out anti-Semitism or any other bigotry wherever it occurs without being worried that you'll be called a bigot if you do it. That's right, Alan. And she was also bullied into apologizing, which she did, which I felt she shouldn't have had to. Anyone should be able to call out anti-Semitism and not have to apologize for that. Thank you so much for being here, Alan. I agree. The rise of the progressive left reminding some Republicans of what happened in their party about 10 years ago with outspoken first-term Democrats creating tension with the leadership by pushing their own agenda in the House. In a Political Magazine article titled, quote, Are Democrats Facing Their Own Tea Party-Style Reckoning? The author writes, quote, A few freshman members in some of the safest seats in the country pursuing an ideologically pure agenda that riles up the party's base but could endanger the moderates who were essential to winning the majority. Let's bring in Carl Rove, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Carl, good morning to you. So is this happening? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The piece by uh, former Congressman Tom Davis of Northern Virginia, I think, is right on target. Um, he, he suggests that the Democrats are facing the same phenomenon the Republicans faced after 2010 when the sort of Tea Party came in and said, you have to be very conservative, even if you're from a moderate part of the country. And we saw this tension played out on the floor of the House. We saw it played out in primaries. Uh, and I think we're li likely to see it uh, play out inside the Democratic Party with one very big difference. And that is that in 2010, when the Tea Party Republicans came in, uh, they had some allies who'd been there before. But when uh, 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 Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, representatives uh, Omar and Tlaib came in, 
Uh, they, they, were, they already found a large number of so-called progressives already there, already uh, demanding things like uh, Medicare for all and impeachment of President Trump and so forth. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a bigger problem for the Democrats, I think, they face uh, today than the Republicans faced in 2011 when they took control of the House again. Interesting, Carl. And in that piece, uh, Tom Davis writes, I witnessed the transformation of my party into one increasingly challenging for centrists, and now I'm seeing the same thing happen to Democrats. Can Nancy Pelosi turn things around? Well, uh, she's, got a she's got a delicate balancing act because she has a significant number of people inside of her caucus who are uh, already out there on the extreme. Medicare for all, uh, guaranteed federal job, universal basic wage, impeachment of the president. And she's tr and, but she recognizes this fundamental fact. Look, there are 235 Democrats today in the House of Representatives. 32 of them are freshmen who, are, who hold a seat that was occupied by a Republican member of Congress and carried by Donald Trump. So if they lose 18 of those people in the next election, they're now 217 and in the minority again in the House of Representatives. So for all that we pay attention to people like AOC and Congresswoman Omar and Congresswoman Tlaib and Maxine Waters and Al Green and Elijah Cummings and Jerry Nadler and a lot of the people who are pressing for more extreme views. The people who put the Democrats back in power are basically people who are from centrist districts that were occupied by a Republican member in the suburbs of places like Chicago and Philadelphia and New York and Atlanta and Dallas and Houston. Harley Ruda, a Democrat from California, a moderate freshman Democrat from California, was on this program last week. He was also on Sunday Morning Futures over the weekend uh, talking about whether or not uh, there is pressure coming from the left wing. Listen. How much pressure are you feeling to go along with some of your freshman colleagues like AOC? I don't feel any pressure at all, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the citizens of Orange County who elected me here recognize that uh, I have moderate views. Whether the outlandish ideas on the left or right, uh, I'm not going to support it. I'm going to work with my Republicans and Democrats who believe that most Americans are between the 20-yard lines and get good legislation accomplished. I want to get your thoughts on that response, Carl. Well, uh, he, he said the right things, but whether or not he's going to be able to achieve them is something else. I mean, uh, are, uh, are the dominant strain inside the Democratic Party in the House being willing to vote for legislation that is a compromise between Republicans and Democrats? We've seen no evidence of that thus far. And one of the, one of the bad things for people who are, who are moderates in both parties is, is that even if they uh, deviate to some degree from the orthodoxy of their party with their votes on the floor of the House, they still get caught up. We lost a lot of members last time around, who uh, Republicans who represented their di districts well, but were being held to account for the dominant strain within the Republican Party. My sense is it's going to be hard for a lot of Democrats to be able to say, well, I'm not AOC, I'm not Omar, I'm not Tlaib, I'm not Jerry Nadler, I'm not Elijah Cummings, I'm not all of these left-wing ideas, Medicare for all, guaranteed job, guaranteed wage, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be hard for them to, to, to take that balancing. Very out. interesting. And lastly, the, the number one lesson that uh, Tom Davis wrote about here was don't mistake your party's opposition to the president for unity. Um, but he points out one particular, one very important detail to that. Pelosi has room to maneuver that her Republican pre predecessor didn't have. Um, it's a really interesting piece, political mag, uh, kind of lengthy, but are Democrats facing their own Tea Party style reckoning? Carl, final thoughts before I let you go. Well, I think uh, Politico uh, did a good, uh, ha has got a good piece in it, and people ought to go read it. But I do think that, that that point is an important one. Simply being in blind opposition to the president is not what the people in those districts, those 32 districts right. that elected the majority for the Democrats want. They want people who will go there and work with the Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. president of whatever party it is, to get things done for the country. But that's not the, that is not the dominant theme inside the Democratic Party. Think about how many Democratic presidential candidates have said, I'll work with Republicans uh, and work across aisles. Two, think about how many Democrats have thus far in leadership in the House stepped forward and said, I want to work with the president and yeah. find common ground. Not a whole lot of them. Carl Rove, interesting stuff. Thank you, sir. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for having me. All right. New Zealand appears set to enact new gun laws in the coming days as police say a gunman who killed 50 people at two mosques there acted alone but might have had support. Now the White House is dismissing attempts to link President Trump's political rhetoric to the terror attack. 
I don't think it's fair to cast this person as a supporter of Donald Trump any more than it is to look at his sort of his echo terrorist passages in that in that manifesto and align him with Nancy Pelosi or uh, uh, Ms. Ocasio Cortez. This was a disturbed individual, an evil person. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts joins us live from the North Lawn with more. John. John, good morning to you. The president's critics in politics and the media drawing connections between the New Zealand killer's ideology and President Trump. The president lashing out at those critics on Twitter in just the last 90 minutes saying, quote, the fake news media is working overtime to blame me for the horrible attack in New Zealand. They will have to work very hard to prove that one so ridiculous. The killer did mention President Trump at a hate-filled screed that he posted online, hailing the president as, quote, a symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose. Kellyanne Conway had this to say about that this morning. He put out a 70-page manifesto, and I guess everybody scoured it, search for Donald Trump's name, and there it is one time. But he also said he aligns closely with the ideology of China. He said he's not a conservative, he's not a Nazi. Also, this president condemns hate and evil and bigotry, and we will continue to do so. People should feel safe, but they should especially feel safe in their places of worship. And we've seen far too often where that is not the case. The White House also reminding this morning that the president has repeatedly said that he is not anti-immigrant, he is anti-illegal immigration, and that those are two very different things. Here's Mick Mulvaney from yesterday morning. That's just absurd to say that there's some type of connection between, between being against illegal immigration, which is what the veto was about for legal immigration, and the, <laughs> the ruthless live streaming of murder of 15 people. The, the two things have nothing to do with each other. The president is not a white supremacist. I'm not sure how many times we have to say that. In an interview yesterday morning, the U.S. ambassador to New Zealand, Scott Brown, former uh, Fox News contributor, echoed those uh, same sentiments and as well tweeted out over the weekend that we stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters. He and his wife also brought 49 lilies from their own garden down to a memorial uh, near the mosque, uh, John, to pay their respects to the uh, victims of that horrific shooting last week. John? John Roberts, our chief White House correspondent there. Thank you.